Yes, um, uh, welcome to the symposium on dermatology. Um, the theme is evolution of dermatology to touch or not to touch. We have four eminent speakers for this session. Uh, Professor Jayamini Seniratna, consultant dermatologist. Dr. Nayani Madrasingha, consultant dermatologist. Dr. Chalukya Gunasekara, consultant dermatologist. And Dr. Janaka Akaravita, consultant dermatologist. Um, to introduce the rules, uh, questions are inter will be entertained at the end of all four presentations and not at the end of each presentation. Audience, please, um, your question should be uh, in the q and answer box. Please do not answer questions orally or type in the chat box. Uh, may I ask Jinari to introduce the first speaker, please? Uh, I would like to introduce the uh, uh, first speaker. Uh, he is uh, Professor Jaimini Seniratna, consultant dermatologist. He is working at Lady Richie Hospital for Children, Colombo. He will be talking on common sense in dermatology. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I thank uh, the president and the council of the Gaul Medical Association for inviting me to speak uh, in the dermatology symposium. Now, in dermatology, we come across many uh, conditions. As you can see, uh, dermatological conditions also can be seen in neonates, infants, children, adults, uh, and elderly. All age groups are involved. And uh, skin diseases are of different uh, pathological conditions. Now about my topic, I would say uh, common sense in clinical practices to think rationally and logically uh, all the time, both in the diagnosis and treatment. And we construct the diagnosis step by step. We rely on mostly valuable objective science. And more importantly, you need to identify the pathological process rather than rely on the name of the condition. In dermatology, things are slightly different. We encounter visible, time, visible signs most of the time, and therefore you don't have to worry about elicitation and interpretation. Many factors determine the appearance of a skin lesion, and I have outlined the important ones. Skin has immense ability to repair the damage. Therefore, we need to focus on uh, this aspect in the management of skin diseases. We often uh, focus on promoting healing. Let me show you a number of common cases. From now onwards, a case series. Now you can see that the, the, the rash is confined to the index finger of the dominant hand. He's a three meter driver. So in his leisure times, he sort of rotates the, the, the key in his index finger, resulting in a contact dermatitis to nickel. As you can see, most of the key tags have a nickel ring. So once this is removed, the treatment is with a topical steroid and uh, he should avoid doing the same thing again. Here is another condition uh, due to the buckle, the belt. Uh, here you see a lot of pigmentation. That, that is a common thing in brown skin on long term. Uh, it leads to post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, which may not improve immediately with the treatment, 
and that may need uh, additional treatment like the prolonged use of emollients. Acne is another common problem. Acne also, uh, since uh, face play a vital role in your body image, when uh, adolescents get uh, acne on the face, they often manipulate it, resulting in pigmentation. At the primary problem in acne is the blockage that occur on the, the duct of the pyrosebaceous unit. The white thing is the block here. The important thing is when you apply topical therapy, it doesn't go down the duct. It has to diffuse through the epidermis to the, the where the problem is, where the block is. So the important message is most of the topical therapy will require a keratinity. Some topical therapies like uh, adapalene, which is currently used, do have a little bit of uh, keratinic activity, but may require an additional treatment. And if the, the block is fairly low down, yeah, you might need some surgical treatment. So these are a few facts about acne. Pigmentation and scarring are major issues. Not only the acne should disappear, people want to have a clear face. Uh, maybe a degree of fairness also is expected by the patient. Next. In acne, you see the, the oily skin called seborrhea. You see inflammation and here you see the scarring. Now, all these needs to be addressed in the treatment. And sometimes when the patient comes, it's the scarring that you see mainly. So this type of patient will not uh, be relieved by topical applications alone. Some form of surgical requirement is uh, needed, like in this young woman, where the, the, the macrocomedones were treated uh, mainly with uh, uh, cauterization targeting the, the block gland. Also, majority of patients with skin disease manipulate their skin lesions. They are upset. Here is a psoriatic patient on biologic, but these lesions persist. This is because uh, when he's, during his uh, free time, he breaks the skin lesions, which cognize to the place. Here is another lady with facial pigmentation. You can appreciate that the pigmentation is more on the right side and she's very depressed about it as well. The picture on the right hand side show her handedness. She's a right hander. That's why the pigmentation is more common on the right side. So treatment alone, uh, applications alone won't work here. Now even patients with leprosy manipulate their skin lesions. Here's a child who keep on demonstrating the anesthesia by pinching the skin. This leads to the formation of the two pigmented nodules. Uh, your, just to check your ability to observe things, uh, this is actually a child who came, up, came with eczema who was uh, missed. Uh, this condition, panhoipopituitism, is a pituitary pretty. Uh, sometimes patients may have serious underlying conditions. This child presented with uh, eczema, this uh, picture that uh, Dr. Akaravita gave me. Uh, you can appreciate on the left hand side pre treatment, the eyelids are swollen, the complexion is straw colored compared to the mother, eye opening is difficult. On the right hand side, after treatment with uh, thyroxine, so she had basically mixed edema. And the eczema will not improve as long as the underlying condition is treated. Uh, we come across a lot of autoimmune skin diseases. You cannot just say a disease is autoimmune in origin. You have to demonstrate for certain things like loss of tolerance. And also sometimes in dermatology, we come across uh, conditions uh, where the immune defect is transferred, say for instance, to the baby. The, Disease is caused by an autoantibody IgG class, 
uh, it gives rise to neonatal skin diseases. Here is a mother with pemphigus. You can see the blisters in the heart palate, and she gave birth to this baby with pemphigus neonatorum. Now, here the antibody is fixed. You don't have to give steroids because its antibody is not generated. Therefore, a symptomatic treatment for the neonate. This is uh, subcutaneous, subacute cutaneous LE on the mother with neonatal lupus in the baby. In brown skin, often pigmentary anomalies dominate in neonatal lupus. Similarly, congenital infections can be transmitted by mother to child. Here is a, a mother's temperature chart and a baby neonate who develop pigmentation and fever. This is congenital chikungunya. Similarly, other organisms that can cross the placenta include uh, Triponema pallidum, the mother had secondary syphilis and the baby got congenital syphilis. So, in our country, the, the VDRL is tested early in the pregnancy. So, if the mother develops syphilis later, the neonate can be, the child can be affected. Similarly, in HIV, on the left hand side is invasive tinea pedis on the child's leg and oral hairy leukoplakia in the mother's tongue, which are sort of, you know, the combination is very diagnostic of AIDS. Uh, patients with AIDS also have a lot of dry skin, cirrhosis. They look aged apart from many infections. A pluritic papular eruption, pigmented purpuric eruption of HIV is shown here. Let me briefly go through other infections. Oloscomy is a commonly occurring condition in childhood. But here, if you look at the lesions uh, apart from each other, underlying skin is normal. Whereas in immune deficiency, serious immune deficiencies, you see large number of molluscums. They are large, they are fused with each other. Uh, molluscum in atopic patients, where the barrier is defective, uh, tends to give rise to inflammation around the lesion, what is known as the halo dermatitis. Need to address all these is uh, issues when you treat. Coming to herpes simplex infection, or also, uh, which is uh, common on this area of the mouth between the near the vermilion border, these vesicles are loosely formed, so they break off very quickly. Next, the primary attack is much severe, where there is drooling of saliva and inability to swallow. And the child can inoculate this virus into other areas like the eye. And the most characteristic feature is the occurrence of lesion uh, limited to a certain area, multiple vesicles, called herpetiform appearance. And here the treatment is with oral acycular topical therapy ward. From time to time, we see epidemics of the so-called hand, foot, mouth. It's but uh, in clinical practice, it's more knee, buttock, elbow syndrome than the typical thumb and sole syndrome. So, this is what I was referring to: the knee, elbow, buttock syndrome than typical hand, foot, mouth disease. And this is an uh, this is a viral infection caused by an enterovirus. During the acute episode, zinc absorption is reduced. If you don't supplement, they lose the nails, as shown here. Um, puritic, purpuric uh, papular eruption is caused by bowel uh, virus infection, where there is a lot of pain and edema. Coming to bullous impetigo. Uh, where the lesions are quite superficial, intra-epidermal, so it doesn't lead to scarring and um, caused by Staph aureus. A Staph aureus is known to produce a lot of toxins which can cause serious conditions like the uh, Staphylococcal scordate skin syndrome. Here you can see the origin of the infection, the focus of primary infection in the ear where you see pustules. These are sterile because this is mediated by the toxin. Uh, serious conditions occur in neonates and 
when it heals, it peels off, leaving the uh, underlying skin uh, without scarring. So that's the Nikolsky sign, which indicates looseness of the upper epidermis. And you can see the pigmented cells beneath. Basis of which was described some time ago. You can read this article in the Indian Journal. Coming to uh, mycoplasma infections, uh, often give rise to a number of lesions in the skin and mucous membranes. And the mucous membrane lesion is shown here. Next one. So there can be skin lesions which are not typical of uh, erythema multiforme. So the proper name is mycoplasma induced rash and mucositis. Uh, coming to typhus, this is the fever pattern that you see in typhus, a biphasic fever pattern, which is usually M-type. And the SK is shown on the right side, but SK is not commonly seen, but you see it's a generalized rash, which depends on, on the, the age of the child and the inoculum of the organism can differ. Uh, sometimes it's purpuric, which is well seen on the palm sensors, or it can be maculopapular, a more bumpy rash than erythema as shown on the right side. Uh, regarding leprosy, we are familiar with uh, most of the types of leprosy. Uh, inoculating leprosy is a little understood entity that I'm going to show you. Here is an infected grandmother who had inoculated the grandchild during uh, uh, sleep or while they slept. Uh, inoculation of leprosy can also occur around the BCG scar. And uh, since the incubation period is quite long, the lesion develops in late childhood. Uh, regarding lepromatous leprosy, you are familiar with the nodular types of lepromatous leprosy, but there are types which are non-nodular as shown here, where there is diffuse infiltrate function of the entire ear. Whereas in uh, relapsing polychondritis, only the cartilaginous areas are affected. Again, inoculating leprosy, this is a beautician. Uh, she inoculated the organism here, and when she rubs, it got inoculated here. So these are uh, forms of leprosy that we often don't recognize as inoculate. The main important thing about leprosy is the sensory impairment and uh, the damage to the autonomic uh, nerves result in loss of hair. A very good sign, and that's a fairly long lasting leash. The nerve damage, the lag of thalamus, is demonstrated here. You can also observe the diffuse erythema and sparsity of the eyebrows. So, the clinical diagnosis is macular anesthetic, uh, borderline tuberculite leprosy with lag of thalamus. And sometimes it can lead to bilateral facial palsy. Pure neural leprosy where the skin lesion is not visible. Uh, this child came with a reaction and you can appreciate that it's on the posterior auricular nerve. Whereas commonly encountered nerve in neural leprosy is the great auricular nerve. And coming to a typical mycobacterial infection, sometimes cause dissemination uh, and uh, vasculitic type resulting in uh, necrosis of digits like this child, where the treatment is uh, lifelong uh, ciprofloxacin and clarithromycin. So the take-home message about leprosy is suspect leprosy in long-standing skin lesions, which are either symptomatic with or the uh, sensory uh, sensation. Skin lesions occurring on known leprous contacts. Uh, skin lesions along with Neural symptoms, especially peripheral nerve damage, patients who live in endemic areas, and when other diseases have been excluded. Infestations, the lava migrants, cutaneous lava migrants, you see a migratory thread-like lesion which moves in the skin, they can't penetrate the basement membrane, and the treatment is with albendazole. Uh, different clinical types that we encounter in this country, the uh, most of the lesions are secondary infected, as you can see on the left-hand side, or you can develop an urticarial rash, as you can see on the right-hand side. 
the ulcerative type is shown on the right hand side where almost cellulitis has occurred whereas in lava currents the organism moves very fast uh, visceral lava migrants occur in the deeper layers is caused by toxophara so a contact history with the dog or a cat is important often with puppies and there's a severe eosinophilic reaction as you can see in the histology and the larvae doesn't respond to typical medication of albendazole. Coming to scabies, you are familiar with the common types. Uh, the trusted scabies occur in certain individuals with uh, immune defects like T cell defects in uh, trisomy 21 or HIV. Uh, this is the nodular type of Norwegian scabies or trusted scabies. This is the diffuse type. There are millions of organisms here and the treatment of choice is ayurvedic that's the scutula or eggs when you scrape you can see the eggs of the, uh, the mite or sometimes you see a live mite just uh, touching psoriasis the different types in gutted psoriasis the lesions are very tiny and you need to induce a scale by scraping whereas small plaques and large plaques are easy to differentiate uh, diffuse types in this child you can observe that the limbs are spared so natural uv light has a very good role and therefore that uh, the patient will respond very well to uh, poor uh, dactylitis is often uh, not recognized in leprosy uh, in psoriasis you can see that the entire digit is swollen and you can appreciate the onycholysis and pitting on the affected nail. In children, any part of the body can be affected. Scalp, which is best treated with uh, a coconut oil compound applied in the night, washed off with a simple shampoo like 2% cetrimide. Next. Uh, whereas flexural psoriasis is little inflammatory and needs a mild topical steroid like hydrocortisone clarfinol combination. In uh, childhood uh, psoriasis, especially in napkin psoriasis, there is invariably a degree of streptococcal infection of the perineum. So anti-streptococcal oral treatment is mandatory. Now this child presented with uh, psoriasis, which is purple in color, you can appreciate the color of the lesions on the neck. The clue to the diagnosis is on the lip, which is cyanosed. So the skin lesions uh, color will be determined by the perfused blood. So if somebody has uh, cyanosis, the skin lesions will also be purple, at least in this time. Whereas pustular psoriasis is an uh, emergency where there is widespread erythema, swelling, and uh, pustules, which fuse to form lakes of pustules, leave a background of uh, hyperpigmentation or a brownish color gives a very uh, the number of signs tell you the diagnosis immediately so if you are to wait for a biopsy the patient will be in a critical condition the treatment is urgent the drug of choice for majority is acetrity thank you thank you sir for that uh, uh, interesting uh, presentation and it uh, sharing your experience with us. Uh, then we will go into second uh, speaker. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Naini Madrasinghe. Uh, she is the consultant dermatologist, National Institute of Infectious Disease, Columbia. She will be talking on dermatophytosis, a new challenge to dermatologists. Over to Naini. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to do this lecture today. I will now share the screen. I would be talking to you on a new challenge to dermatologists, that is dermatophytosis. Dermatophytosis, or which is commonly known as tinea infection, is a disease of the stratum corneum of the skin, and it can also affect the nail and scalp hair. 
It is caused by a keratinophilic fungi, which is known as dermatophytes. The clinical features may vary depending on the site that is involved. And depending on the site, there are different names given to the disease. The typical clinical feature consists of round erythematous plaque with central clearing and active border. This active border consists of scaling, erythema, papules, and sometimes pustules. Tinea cruris, that is tinea infection in groin. Tinea barbe, which is occurring in beard area, this presents at scaling and follicular centric pustules, and this hair will be easily packable. Tinea fascia is tinea infection occurring in non bearded parts of the face. This usually have an atypical presentation and sometimes this can be misdiagnosed as other skin diseases as well. Tinea pedis will have different uh, clinical presentations with whitish curd like material in, uh, in between toes and hyperkeratosis with scaling on the soles and vesicobulous skin lesions. Tinea manum usually affects one hand with erythema, scaling, and uh, dryness. This may be an extension of the tinea pedis. Tinea capitis is commonly seen in uh, children. They usually come with uh, patches of non-scarring alopecia, and there will be scaling in the underlying scalp. And also the cervical lymph nodes may be enlarged. Tinea Inflammatory tinea capitis is also known as kirion, and this is caused by a zoophilic uh, uh, dermatophyte uh, species. And the presentation of inflammatory tinea capitis is somewhat different. It presents at a, as an inflamed foggy mass resembling an abscess, and this is commonly mistaken as an abscess, and often incisional and drainage is performed. The di early diagnosis of this is important because this can give rise to scarring alopecia. So early intervention with oral antifungal agents are important to prevent the scarring alopecia. The diagnosis of dermatophyte infection is fairly easy. It is usually a clinical diagnosis and sometimes it is aided by skin scrapings for fungal microscopy. Actually, dermatophytosis used to be an easily treatable disease. And maybe a few years back, I would even not think of doing a dermatophytosis as a separate lecture to a forum like this. But times have changed, and so is dermatophyte infection. Recent, recently, dermatologists are observing increasing incidence of dermatophyte infections, which is rapidly spreading in the household with extensive disease and atypical presentations. And most alarmingly and most disturbingly, there's an inadequate therapeutic response to commonly used oral antifungal agents, which gives rise to chronic and recalcitrant disease and recurrences. This trend has been first reported in India, and we too are following the same. To objectively assess this, we did an island-wide multi-center study with representations from all nine provinces. And it showed that lesions were present in more than, for, for more than six months in 23.9%. That indicates actually chronic disease. And multiple sites were involved in 65.9%. And atypical sites such as the facial involvement was seen in 20.7%. In another online survey uh, consisting of 50 dermatologists, 88% of them believed that there's a lack of therapeutic response to commonly used uh, antifungal agents. So this problem of low therapeutic uh, response, that is the therapeutic failure of dermatophytosis for the commonly used oral antifungals, we may not be seeing the actual picture, but just the tip of the iceberg. What could be the causes for this therapeutic failure? It is multifactorial with host, fungi, environmental, and drugs having a play role. Environmental related factors such as hot to humid temperature and overcrowding may contribute to this with the favoring favorable conditions for the fungi to proliferate and harbor. And then we have the drug related factors. Actually, this is one of the important factors because there are many 
drug related factors which will be contributing to the therapeutic failure one such thing is resistance both primary and resi uh, secondary resistance for for oral antifungals is reported and then the other important thing could be that although we think that there's a therapeutic uh, low therapeutic response we may not be given the proper drug in proper doses and duration and then the quality of the drugs is also important when there are different brands of oral antifungals and then the drug interactions because these oral antifungal agents are known to have drug interactions with commonly used other drugs they are may not uh, it may not be achieving the desired therapeutic concentration and then the other most important thing is the poor compliance so we have to make it a note that we should uh, uh, advise our patients that they should continue the oral antifungals or the, the therapy that we give for the desired duration because patients tend to stop this when they, they achieve the symptomatic control and the cost of these drugs may also may be having an important um, part because sometimes the oral antifungals are not available in the government sector and then when we give it from the private sector the cost is sometimes unbearable so this may also lead to poor compliance resistance to azoles and terbinafine is both reported from india actually we don't know the status in our country but we are under doing an antifungal sensitivity studies at the moment Talking about the preferred uh, oral antifungal uh, drug, this was an, another online survey conducted on general practitioners, and it was shown that fluconazole was the most preferred oral antifungal agent, both in the private sector and in the government sector. And if it uh, considered the best antifungal agent would not be fluconazole, and I would be dealing it with tetra. Then the quality. The quality of itraconazole will depend on small pellet size, large number of pellets, and minimal variation in pellet size. This study, which uh, from India, they have looked at the pellet size by a dermatoscope, and you can see the variation in pellet size. And also the uniform white uh, colored pellets are found to be dummy pellets. So actually we can imagine the quality of the drug. Then the fungi related factors, that is the next important factor. It could be actually that the fungi is getting resistance to the oral antifungal agents. Or it could be that we are having a change in the predominant fungal species. Our previous study showed that the predominant fungal species causing dermatophyte infection is trichophyte and mentoprophytes. Actually, a decade ago, this was trichophyte and rubrum, and now it has changed with trichophyte and mentoprophytes predominating. The same trend has been reported in India. So, trichophyte and mentoprophytes is known to cause more virulent disease. So, this may be largely contributing for the lack of therapeutic response that we see today. And this was further proved from our study, which showed the partial clearance percentage was significantly higher in trigophyte and mentographites when compared to trigophyte and rubrum. And also the recurrences after complete response was significantly higher in trigophyte and mentographites when compared to trigophyte and rubrum. Then the host related factors, like we have to advise the patients regarding these actually to get a good therapeutic outcome, like uh, proper personal hygiene and the change of fashion sense. Actually, the younger generation are more in favor of these tight fitting clothes and uh, nylon underwear. So we have to advise them uh, regarding this. And also the other important factor is if there are more than one family member affected, they should all take the treatment together. And then the immunosuppression. So as you know, the percentage of uh, the people with immunosuppression is increasing with large number of patients with diabetes, renal transplant patients, and then uh, the patients undergoing chemotherapy. These patients may harbor in the infection for longer periods of time, giving rise to spread within their household. Then one of the most important factors in this lack of therapeutic response in dermatophytosis is the topical usage of steroids which causes a local reduction of immunosuppression. Use of topical steroids will alter the clinical presentation 
reduce inflammation and scaling. Therefore, even if they come to a dermatologist, it's very difficult to obtain skin scaling for a diagnosis. And also it causes ineffective fungal clearance because of the low uh, uh, reduced cell mediated immunity, which is uh, happening in the local area due to the topical steroid. And this will give rise to chronic persistent disease and also need for the longer durations of oral antifungal agents. So these are some instances where topical steroids have been used to, uh, for dermatophytosis. You can see that this is known as ring within ring appearance, also known as tinea pseudoinibricata. And here a potent topical steroid has been used on the face. The margins are indistinct and there's less information. And in the hands, you can even see the steroid induced hypopigmentation. In our study also, we were able to see that the partial clearance rate was significantly higher in the patients who, uh, in the group that had received a topical steroid before presenting to the dermatologic clinics than the group that had not received any topical steroids. And also the recurrences were significantly higher in the group that had received a topical steroids. So although the facts of using topical steroids are like that, which causes a big uh, damage to the dermatophyte infection, it was noted that 63.2% of the patients had received some kind of a topical steroid before presenting to the dermatologic clinics. Actually, this study was done before the time the COVID pandemic hit us, so the percentage may be even more now. And unfortunately, it was seen that most of the topical steroid prescriptions were either from the hospital outpatient department or by the general practitioners. And I think this is a failure of all medical professionals. We as dermatologists have not taken an active role in imparting knowledge and the general practitioners or the medical officers are also engaged in a uh, wrong clinical practice by giving topical steroids for dermatophyte infections. Now we are coming to the most important part of this talk. Can we overcome this problem of low therapeutic response? Yes, we can. If we all act res responsibly and act together, we can overcome this problem. Method number one is not to use steroids. So usage of topical steroids at any stage of uh, dermatophyte infection is a big no. So if you take that message from this lecture, that is also a big achievement. Sometimes topical steroids are used to reduce the inflammation and for uh, symptomatic control in the initial stage of this infection, but that practice is also now not encouraged. And the most common indication is when the diagnosis is not clear, people tend to give a topical steroid or a combination cream. This practice is strongly discouraged because for the above reasons that I mentioned earlier. If you're not sure about the diagnosis, just to give some oral antihistamines, which will achieve some symptomatic control, get down the patient again, and then you will get a proper idea. Then method number two is proper management. Proper management of dermatophyte infection is important. And topical antifungals are indicated when there's a single or one uh, small lesion. And these could be uh, continued two weeks post-resolution and it has to be applied two centimeters beyond the active margin. There are a range of topical antifungals in the market and actually it is according to the prescriptor's preference and it is better to combine uh, the topical antifungal and the oral antifungal from two different classes. Then you have the systemic antifungals. Itraconazole and terbenafine are the preferred oral antifungal agents in dermatophyte infections and glucerfulvin also can be used because that is the widely available drug in the government sector. Then what about flucans? Although commonly practiced, this is not usually considered as effective in the management of dermatophytes. And also it has shown, like there are a few studies which have shown efficacy with the 50 milligram daily dose, but not the 150 milligram weekly dose that is commonly practiced. And then the other fear is that the uh, common usage of the uh, 
fluconazole may cause resistant strains of uh, candidiasis developing. Therefore, please keep your fluconazole for candida infections and not for dermatophytes. The dose and the duration. This is also very important because giving inadequate doses and for inadequate durations may give rise to resistant survival of the resistant strains. And also that will clear the skin lesions partially, giving rise to spread within the household and then like later recurrences. The dose of terbinafine is 250 milligrams daily and itraconazole is uh, 200 milligrams daily, like uh, it is given in usually a twice a day dose and per kg doses also require there. The duration of the oral antifungal will actually depend on the site, but the minimum duration should be two to four weeks. And now we see actually even longer durations of oral antifungal agents are needed to achieve a complete clearance. And if the patients have used the topical steroids earlier, then the need for the oral antifungal agents, are uh, the duration will become even longer. Tina incognito is when they have used a topical steroid earlier. These oral antifungal agents, we have to use them very carefully because at the moment we have a problem of uh, overuse of steroids in dermatophyte infections. But in India, they have another problem that is the misuse of ASOs. Azole group oral antifungals, which can be used for a longer durations, like shorter durations, and like uh, not proper dosages, and like giving intermittent doses, may give rise to a problem like of drug resistance. So this could be our future. Therefore, we have to be very careful in using the oral antifungals with proper dosages and for the proper duration. If there's inability to follow up, it's always better to refer because we have only limited drug choices. So it's not like antibiotics. When it comes to oral antifungals, we have only very limited number. So please be careful when you are pre prescribing oral antifungals to do the right thing because then at the end, if not, we will not have anything much to offer to our patients. Then the method number three is timely referral. So as I mentioned earlier, if the diagnosis is not sure, or if you are not, uh, not uh, able to follow up the patient fully, then it's better to refer to a specialized center. And also uh, things like extensive tinea corporis, recalcitrant and chronic disease, and patients with other comorbidities are better followed up at specialized centers. So if we do all these things, and if we all act responsibly, and uh, we might be able to overcome the problem of this low therapeutic response of dermatophytosis before it becomes a major public health issue in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Naini, for the your interesting speech we, uh, because this uh, tinea infection is uh, very challenging in these days to treat by dermatologists, not only the dermatologists, by others. Thank you very much. Um, let me introduce the next speaker, Dr. Chalukya Gunasekar, a consultant dermatologist, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. She'll be talking to us on dermatology beyond borders to achieve perfect skin. Uh, Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank the President and the Council of the Gold Medical Association for, for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you today. So, in the past, a dermatologist was expected to treat uh, either KO or control skin diseases within the borders of the disease and not give much attention to what happens afterwards or the sequelae and aftermath of a skin disease. So in my talk, I would like to uh, justify the evolution of cosmetic dermatology. I will touch upon skin aging and preservation of the skin. I know people of uh, my age group would be particularly interested in this part and also present you with the armamentarium of uh, options that are available in cosmetic dermatology. So, if you look at a cross-section of dermatological conditions that uh, dermatologists would deal with, 
uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You would all agree that what is common about all these are the fact that there is a tremendous cosmetic impact on the patient, especially when it's on the face. Now, if I were to cross off the conditions which would be referred to as trivial or just purely cosmetic, you would agree that it's still the devastating impact on the skin is equal irrespective of the underlying cause. This has been proven again and again with studies on quality of life index in patients with skin diseases, both in adults and among children, where the quality of life index is uh, equal to even severe uh, underlying uh, internal diseases such as renal disease and even diabetes. So there has developed a need for uh, dermatology dealing with this aspect and in the West, within the past three decades, uh, this has uh, developed tremendously and we can also witness this in our own backyard as shown by these uh, studies over the past 20 years of clinic attendance patterns where we see uh, uh, patterns of uh, behavior seeking uh, treatment for what were previously called pure cosmetic indications. Therefore, cosmetic dermatology is the maintenance of a normal appearance of the skin, restoring it or enhancing it. And similarly, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, cosmetics are items that are applied on the skin to improve the appearance of the skin or enhance the appearance of the skin. And cosmetics can play a vital role on a day-to-day -day basis in transforming a person's face from a you can see a plain girl has been transformed into a beautiful one and we uh, witness this every day with our beautiful brides. Every bride is uh, equally beautiful with a beautiful complexion due to the usage of cosmetics. Of course, as dermatologists, we do promote uh, camouflaging skin diseases which can have a tremendous psychological impact and cause social embarrassment such as which like of the face. Now, at this point, I'd like to introduce this term called cosmeceutical, which is something that sits on the fence between a cosmetic and a drug. Uh, in Sri Lanka, in the National Medicine Regulatory Authority, these are referred to as borderline products. These are used both to treat diseases as well as for cosmetic, purely cosmetic indications as well. Now, talking of diseases, Sometimes the definition of a disease can become a little blurred because if you take aging, we know there is time-gated intrinsic or chronological aging, which happens to everybody. There is also the accelerated form of this, which is due to the effects of the sun or also called extrinsic or photo-aging. Photo-aging is mediated via the ultraviolet A and B rays of the sun working through uh, reactive oxygen species, which can produce DNA photoproducts, both in epidermal keratinocytes as well as on the underlying dermal collagen. And this can manifest in a variety of ways, starting from pigmentary changes, such as uh, hyper or depigmentation, textural changes like wrinkling, which are seen more in fair uh, skin people, vascular changes such as uh, telangiectasia, then benign lesions like seborrheic keratosis are accelerated with age and of course dreaded pre-malignant and malignant lesions even such as malignant melanoma can be driven by photoaging. Hence, there is a demand uh, for uh, controlling these changes and uh, interestingly, even our own elderly population are seeking uh, solutions for these problems uh, nowadays. Hence, a dermatologist now needs to move beyond traditional and conventional uh, therapeutic dermatology and embrace uh, this concept of cosmetic dermatology so that a total or holistic dermatological care can be given to your patient. And this is exemplified by this therapeutic ladder dealing with photoaging starting with, of course, primary preventive measures, as in any disease, prevention is always better, uh, and then going on to more invasive methods of treating photoaging. So I will uh, start with the most simple form of uh, treatment in cosmetic dermatology, namely uh, 
cream applications and these range from sunscreens to skin lightening preparations. Sunscreens, of course, uh, uh, are something that is, uh, is something that is useful even in primary prevention of aging of the skin. And uh, the better sunscreens will give a broad spectrum of coverage against both ultraviolet A rays and ultraviolet B rays. And the strength of a sunscreen is uh, measured by what is called the sun protection factor or the SPF value. And the higher the SPF value, the better the protective effect. And any decent sunscreen nowadays is expected to have an SPF value of 30 or more. Sunscreens are made up of two components, inorganic agents like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide and organic uh, chemicals as well. And the better sunscreens will combine uh, components from both these to give a good uh, ultraviolet uh, coverage. Of course, the usage of sunscreens must be done properly. There are some rules and regulations to follow or else you will not get the necessary effects. Okay, getting on to some anti-aging cosmeceuticals. Topical retinoids have the most amount of backup studies and data and retinoids have been around for many, many years. Uh, ranging from uh, tretinoin to adapalene. Then we, uh, we have antioxidant uh, cosmeceuticals. Out of uh, the antioxidant vitamins, vitamin C has the most, most amount of backup data for usage. But there are lots of other uh, compounds on the pipeline which are gaining momentum nowadays. Then going on to skin lightening preparations, uh, of course, as dermatologists, we prefer to reserve uh, these preparations for actual hyperpigmentations, uh, either disease uh, uh, due to disease or of even a cosmetic nature. These are some uh, patients who have hyperpigmentation, some patients following collagen vascular diseases, sometimes post inflammatory hyperpigmentation after any disease can lead to. This, this kind of hyperpigmentation. However, in the Asian subcontinent and also even in Sri Lanka, there is this madness for uh, whitening of the skin because fairness seems to be equated with uh, beauty by many people. And this has led to the flooding of the market, of course, promoted by social media of many, many uh, uh, unsavory and unregistered uh, whitening products and therefore as dermatologists we are faced every day with the, the repercussions of usage of these whitening products uh, starting from contact allergies and even burns going on to hyperpigmentary spots as well as even depigmentations and also uh, recalcitrant acne uh, atrophy of the skin and stri. And we know that these are mediated by the usage of super potent steroids, uh, which are actually prepared by unregistered people, even in, in homes, people prepare these and distribute them over social media. And as a college, Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists has brought this to the attention of the authorities. However, because there is, uh, there are some problems with the enactment of the Cosmetic Act of Sri Lanka, no meaningful steps have been taken yet by the authorities to address this issue. So uh, among skin lightening preparations, as dermatologists, we do have a number of uh, products available to us, out of which hydroquinone is the prototype skin lightening chemical. It is uh, a chemical that acts against the tyrosinase, uh, the rate limiting step in uh, the melanogenesis pathway and its uh, related product Arbutin are very useful. However, they need to be used at the correct percentage for the correct period of time or else you can have complications. Kojic acid and acetic acid are less powerful uh, chemicals in this area. Then we have the alpha hydroxy acids or fruit acids. Uh, these are an interesting group of uh, chemicals because they, they have multiple actions. They exfoliate the skin. They help to preserve the collagen in the underlying dermis, so uh, they are gaining momentum as very popular products. Now, coming on to glutathione, I'm sure some of you may have heard of uh, this chemical. It is available as topical, oral, as well as IV preparations. 
However, due to lack of uh, backup data on safety issues, the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists has given some recommendations to the National Medicine Regulatory Authority regarding the usage of glutathione. Glutathione works by actually uh, driving the pathway of melanogenesis towards a more a lighter form of melanin production. Uh, we have recommended the dose capping uh, for oral glutathione and intravenous glutathione is actually not registered in Sri Lanka and not recommended due to lack of backup uh, data. However, uh, and this is this has been accepted by the NMRA, but sadly, if you do a Google search, uh, you can find so many places offering IV glutathione. Then going on to oral supplements, uh, of course, uh, needless to say, a healthy uh, diet is the most important part of this. Uh, a lot of the uh, antioxidant vitamins uh, do help in preser preserving the skin. Uh, recently, uh, collagen peptides have gained popularity uh, and are being used more and more. Okay. So going on to the more interventional procedures in cosmetic dermatology, we have a range of uh, procedures available, starting from chemical peels to dermal fillers to lasers. But at this point, I need to uh, point out that embarking on cosmetic dermatology uh, can be like walking in a mine, minefield because there are so many uh, complications and problems that can crop up, especially because people seeking cosmetic consultations tend to be uh, uh, very demanding. And unless a dermatologist is armed with the knowledge and uh, the experience to deal with these issues, uh, it can be a veritable minefield. So starting with chemical peeling, the most simple procedure uh, available. Uh, if this is a controlled destruction of the superficial layers of the skin uh, to the required depth uh, by the application of a chemical agent. And we can uh, do this according to the depth we require, uh, starting from very superficial peels, which just go up to the stratum corneum, going re right up to even the mid dermis, depending on the chemical that, are, that is used. Uh, some of the indications are pigmentary conditions, such as uh, melasma and freckles, uh, early acne scars can benefit with chemical peeling and also of course improvement of wrinkling can be done with this. And some of the agents that are available to us are out of these the most popular ones are uh, alpha hydroxy acids or glycolic acid, uh, the salicylic acids at different percentages and trichloroacetic acid. The chemical peeling uh, I have been doing since 2006 and these are some of my patients who have benefited from this procedure. Uh, we are very comfortable with this procedure because uh, if you follow proper protocol, you can avoid many of these complications. Otherwise, if not done properly, if the patient is not prepared, there can be uh, disastrous repercussions with even chemical peeling. Going on to subcision, also known uh, uh, referring to subdermal incisional undermining. A very simple procedure, just requires a needle uh, and proper technique and training. The idea is when you're dealing with atrophic uh, skin lesions, you just put the needle in and break the tissues, the fibrous tissues, which are binding the skin down, uh, skin down. And uh, this is the first study that we uh, did in Sri Lanka. Uh, way back in 2009, and we have had very good results with this, provided the correct uh, patient is chosen for the procedure, and uh, we are doing these procedures up to now. Microderm abrasion, uh, where it is basically like uh, sandpapering the skin. Uh, 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 an abrasive crystal is used via a handpiece, and uh, uh, resurf the skin is resurfaced and the indications and complications are very similar to uh, chemical peeling except that the machine needs to be available for this procedure. Going on to dermal fillers. These are very popular among the West because dermal fillers are particularly useful to fill out 
hollows and uh, atrophic areas of the skin and even deep wrinkles. Uh, the fair skin people in the Western world uh, love this procedure because wrinkling is a big problem uh, amongst their skin types. But in our part of the world, uh, there is less of a dem demand for fillers. Uh, there are many, many fillers ranging from collagen to uh, hyaluronic acid to even your own fat. And the effects can last from a couple of months to even up to two years. In our practice, we do use these even uh, for pure dermatological diseases. This is one of my patients who has morphia of the right side of the face. And all she wanted was to just look beautiful and have a more symmetrical face uh, for her wedding. And I think we helped her to achieve this. And uh, of course, if not done, if uh, proper technique is not followed, there can be disastrous complications. Uh, like uh, swelling, allergy, and even necrosis of the skin. Next, we get on to botulinum toxin, or Botox as it's known, used in many specialties nowadays, including neurology. Uh, in dermatology, um, we tend to use these more for the dynamic wrinkling uh, of the face, which is like the frown wrinkles, when you frown in the upper part of the face, the wrinkles that form on your forehead and around the eyes. There are some other indications for Botox uh, as well. Uh, it is a very safe procedure provided, uh, uh, done pro it's done properly. Complications are very few, such as facial asymmetry. Of course, the effect lasts only uh, about six to nine months, and therefore this is one of the drawbacks of this procedure because of the very high cost involved. Then going on to platelet-rich plasma usage, we know about the abundance of growth factors uh, present in platelet granules, and it is this quality that is used in many other conditions as well, other than in dermatology. So as dermatologists, we use it to fill out uh, uh, hollows or breakages of the skin, such as in uh, deep acne scars or leg ulcers, and there are many other indications, including morphia. And there are very few contraindications for PRP. Of course, the, the disadvantages, what, once again, is the fact that the procedure is costly uh, because it has to be prepared with a special machine. It consumes time and there can be a lot of pain. Pain, of course, can be reduced by using what is called a derma pen. And also, of course, it needs repeated uh, injections. Uh, talking of PRP, uh, it is a very useful option in the pattern alopecias and very popular among dermatologists. Uh, of course, the crowning glory of uh, treating alopecias is hair transplantation. Unfortunately, very few dermatologists have undertaken this procedure uh, because of time constraints. It's very time consuming and needs specialized equipment to harvest the hair. So, unfortunately, this has led to uh, many other unregistered people taking up this uh, uh, therapeutic option. Okay, so going on to lasers. This has been the game changer in cosmetic dermatology. Laser stands for light amplification by simulated emission of radiation. Uh, there are many, many laser mas machines available in the, the world nowadays, but of course at a very high cost and every day more and more sophisticated machines are being offered uh, with a very high price tag, of course. And uh, the, depending on the type of laser media that is that are used and depending on the target tissue that you are trying to reach, uh, there are different lasers that can be used. Of course, this is one of the problems when you are doing uh, lasers in cosmetic dermatology. Uh, you have to have many, many lasers for uh, the different indications. And uh, these are some pictures of um, uh, my patients at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. We have a combined PDL and India Glacier at uh, National Hospital. And also I'm happy to say that many other hospitals around the country can now offer this uh, facility to uh, their patients. So among lasers, in the vascular lasers, the most popular ones are PDL and NDA glazes, and some of the indications are mainly the vascular birthmarks. Uh, 
the complications can occur unless proper uh, procedure is followed. You can end up with disastrous burns. Uh, so one must know the settings, the, how to titrate the, the settings uh, when, when using the sun patients. Uh, pigment lasers are very popular for uh, many of the pigmentary indications uh, going from freckles to uh, deep dermal nevi. Uh, and the most popular ones are the Q-switched NDEI lasers. And these are available in many centers of Sri Lanka. So talking of tattoos, our youth are very impulsive. And they will go and have a tattoo done. It's very popular among the young generation nowadays. They have a tattoo done without uh, thinking further about it. And I have had many girls who have their boyfriend's names tattooed. And then once they change their boyfriend, they want this, this tattoo removed. Fortunately, we can offer uh, tattoo laser removal and save their relationship. Uh, right. So then Lasers are also useful in uh, taking off unwanted hair, either physiological or pathological. And this is an excellent procedure with minimum or no scarring. Uh, and patients are very satisfied with the results provided a good machine is used and at correct uh, uh, settings. Uh, one must also remember that laser can have uh, many complications, especially if we don't follow protocol like uh, eye protection. It is very vital to protect the eyes of both the patient and the, the uh, doctor who is doing it. Otherwise, there can be disastrous complications. Then there are the ablative lasers, ablation of uh, excessive tissues, uh, commonly used for uh, the warts and keratoses, as well as scars. Uh, Burn scars can be quite very useful. Carbon dioxide laser is the prototype ablative laser, which goes pretty deep in the skin. Then there are the, the more superficial, non-ablative, uh, the fractionated lasers, which are used more for skin resurfacing and removal of either acne or other uh, scars. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have been able to convince you that it is time that a dermatologist move beyond conventional borders and try to deliver a, a near perfect skin to the patients by a combination of the disciplines of therapeutic dermatology, procedure, as well as cosmetic dermatology. And this is uh, uh, emphasized on this slide where if you wish to do an acne scar revision, because there are different types of acne scars from superficial to very deep, uh, what are called box scars. See, so there are non-invasive methods. Then there are the minimally invasive procedures that I have already spoken to you about. And then there are more invasive methods of dealing with these scars. So it is important that the, the dermatologist uh, is able to uh, use these procedures in, the, in an optimum manner, either as a sequential, in a sequential manner or in a combined manner, uh, so that the best results are delivered to your patient. Thank you. And I wish to thank my senior registrars, Dr. Rajivi Abhinayaka and Dr. Karani Samusinga, whose invaluable help has went a long way in getting this presentation together. Okay, thank you, Charlie Kuya, for that uh, very informative presentation. Uh, may I introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Janaka Akaravit, a consultant dermatologist, uh, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Colombo. He'll be talking to us on teledermatology, opportunities and challenges. Over to Janaka. First, let me thank uh, World Medical Association and uh, Dr. Achala Lienage for giving me this opportunity for, to talk on teledermatology, different aspects of it. Um, the WHO defines teledermatology as use of communication technologies in healthcare services 
to exchange medical information for diagnosis, treatment, prevention, research, evolution, and education over a distance. So that indicates actually even at the moment we are involved in activity related to telemedicine. So the dermatology especially uh, is a much popular field for uh, telemedicine because we uh, have actually visual uh, techniques we use very much to diagnose patients. So it is much popular in dermatology. There are different uh, uh, models of teledermatology services. It can be primary teledermatology with the GP getting involved between the dermatologist and the patient. Sometimes it can be directly assisted with by the patient. And also, uh, there may be tertiary teledermatology, that is where the dermatologist want to get a second opinion from a, another dermatologist. And also, we, the dermatologist can uh, use the telephone, uh, the mobile phones or the other uh, apparatuses to deliver certain messages or monitor the patient's uh, reports, etc. Uh, uh, that is, uh, we are getting directly connected to the consumer. The data can be um, delivered uh, in a store and forward method, that is where the patient collects the pictures and uh, collect the reports and they are forwarded to the clinician and the clinician will see them and respond. The other method of data transmission is real-time interactive where the patient and the clinician are directly communicating each other on real time. Uh, but actually commonly what we do is the a hybrid form where we receive the pictures beforehand and then we get in connected with the patient. Um, so when we take uh, like in, in a broader manner, there are so much of advantages or opportunities concerned with teledermatology. Uh, mainly it is uh, cost effectiveness and healthcare savings are uh, sort of uh, important. So it allows remote analysis and monitoring of data as well as we can store the data. Now, when the patients send the pictures, we can uh, uh, store them. So sometimes they are automatically stored in our uh, mobile phones. So that is, uh, that facility also is there. And uh, so it reduces unnecessary or non-urgent visits to the hospital. So that will uh, reduce the burden in the hospital as well as the transportation of the patient. So that will save a, a lot of money for the patient as well as the health system. And also in certain situations, uh, this can improve the revenue to the hospital, uh, especially, I mean, uh, revenue earning institutions where the clinicians can be uh, involved in, in teledermatology where they are not directly seeing patients. And uh, sometimes it can attract new patients and produces no-show events because we are directly connecting to the patient where, from wherever he is. And in, in a situation where the clinician hope to practice from home with teledermatology facility, the overhead for the institution, like supply and room, air conditioning, other healthcare services, so that overhead will be less. So when we look at from the perspective of the patient, uh, so it uh, increases the availability of more specialists to the access of the patient. And when you want to refer, to any specialist, specialist uh, available in the country, we can do that. They are involved in teledermatology or telemedicine. So regardless of the location of the patient and the clinician. And if the patient is affordable and is aware about the technical aspect of uh, teledermatology, it is very much easier for the patient to reach out with, uh, even if it's a simple question or a new sign developing or when, when new symptom developing and also uh, get health advice uh, with the, uh, very easy access to the clinician. Now in uh, this article it's published in 2011, teledermatology is compared to a train where you are walking along the train track. So the teledermatology, when the train comes, the Dermatologists or the clinicians have to 
get uh, on board. So most of us will be doing that. But otherwise, you have to completely get out of the way or get unknown. So I think uh, it is after about 10 years later. So basically, the technology train is coming. So most of us are ready to get on. But before uh, that, we should know about the limitations of this uh, newer uh, technological method of seeing patients. So there are many facets of limitations. Uh, there is a significant significant breakdown in the relationship between clinician and the patient. We know from the moment the patient enters to the room, we gather information about patient, so that part is not there, and we greet the patient and uh, until the patient uh, goes out from the room. And so there are certain uh, special clinical rules where we can use the other sensors other than the visual uh, sense. So the, all those are missing with this method of uh, consultation, as well as uh, physical contact is especially important in uh, certain situations in like in psoriasis, vitiligo, where patients are much embarrassed about their uh, physical appearance. So physical touch would be a much relieving uh, event for the patient. Um, and we can't understand the uh, uh, sort of emotional aspect of the patient because we are not seeing the, uh, uh, patient in a sort of a real uh, situation and uh, so patient may be having some other defects which may not detect while we uh, talk with in, over the phone so all these uh, facts lead to a situation like uh, the patient as well as the clinician sometimes feel that uh, this is not something really happening so depersonalization so it's like uh, watching a movie so the patient may not feel that uh, really he had a consultation with the clinician. Um, from our point, we may be unable to uh, visualize some areas of skin which may give a good clue for our diagnosis. So if the patient has not photographed and uh, if the patient is not uh, thinking that it is relevant. And uh, so physical examination, uh, palpation, percussion, auscultation, all those things are cut off with this method. So, uh, so with this situation, there is uh, reduced confidence in patients and clinicians about the uh, outcome of the teledermatology consultation. The technological limitations are much more when it is uh, considering like a government sector hospital, so organizational and bureaucratic difficulties. We have to plan the infrastructure by the instruments, etc. But uh, and uh, there may be certain regulations by the telecommunication uh, authorities, etc. Also, uh, there may be some issues with uh, uh, how to uh, charge the patient, payment methods, etc. In the private sector, and uh, there may be difficulties in ensuring quality of care delivered with through telemedicine dermatology and also the implementation of healthcare, certain healthcare policies. And not only at the constitutional level, actually um, individual uh, uh, healthcare workers knowledge about technology is also important to implement this properly. So some of the clinicians are, uh, have a fear of technology due to its rapid uh, advances. So those things will be a uh, hindrance for proper involvement. And uh, from the patient point of view, there may be cultural and linguistic differences. And uh, so they may not understand how to handle the uh, communication uh, tools. And uh, so there are no uh, standards uh, agreed yet. And so the quality of images are very much important for us to diagnose about the skin uh, condition. So that is an important uh, point we have to think about when we ignore it, uh, teledermatology. Uh, teledermatology is actually not very costly when it is implemented, but initially there may be some involvement of uh, regarding the equipment and human resources are required. And there may be issues of uh, insurance coverage and reimbursement of teledermatology treatment as well as the consultation fees, etc. And uh, we know now actually uh, 
Most of the telemetry consultations are now carried with the social media and direct uh, phone conversations, etc. But there are telemetry um, uh, platforms, uh, so the cost effectiveness is not assessed with that. And there is a, a big issue in confidentiality because these uh, photographs sent by the patients will be stored in our uh, phones sometimes. So uh, with, uh, if somebody can steal them, uh, hack them, so that will be a very uh, uh, like a very frustrating situation for the patient as well as the clinicians if they leak out. So those are special points we have to consider when we involve in teledermatology practice. And if we uh, are running a remote clinic-like situation where a medical officer is uh, connecting the patient to us, Sometimes the clinical staff may feel that they have become just technicians. So it's one issue uh, in that aspect. And the telemedicine mark is uh, market driven. So that also is a concern when we involve in this. And the geographical uh, locations may be exceeded. Sometimes even somebody who is living abroad may connect through uh, the uh, dermatology uh, route to you, sometimes that can uh, give rise to certain issues. What about the ethical issues uh, of the clinician? So there are occasions where the clinician have been abused because uh, the clinicians also may be uh, involved in the uh, teledermal practice in a single room and uh, the patient is at home. Sometimes they are not in good attire and uh, they don't uh, see the professional uh, communication uh, with the uh, clinician. Some people have different desires. Uh, they want to chat with the uh, female clinicians and uh, sort of uh, so many uh, occasions have happened. So that is another issue regarding the ethical aspects. And as we know, there are no defined rules and regulations still. So those have to be formulated when you practice or so whether patients can uh, sue for your incorrect diagnosis. So whether proper diagnosis was not made, et cetera. And, um, and there are concerns about uh, the limitations of fees as well. Now, the other issue is how accurate uh, our diagnosis uh, compared to the physical consultation. So in this study, uh, about 40 uh, pediatric cases are compared. So when they came, photographs were taken and passed to a dermatologist and uh, for teledermatology consultation, same time, they were subjected to in-office uh, examination by a pediatric dermatologist. So they have compared the two outcomes and overall diagnostic confidence was 83%. So that's, uh, I mean, reasonably well uh, uh, concordance, but still uh, about 17% of time there is a difference between the physical examination and the final diagnosis. This uh, teledermatology will improve when higher quality images were included in, the, in their review. Uh, in this study, they have assessed the patient satisfaction. Then again, it is uh, at a higher level, 82% when they receive a prescription, but it is not so when a prescription is not given. And uh, to see that it is interesting, the patients also prefer that uh, teledermatology service to be at low cost. We know we have to spend more time for teledermatology consultation rather than in a physical one, but the patients expect it to be at a lower cost. Um, now, with the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we know teledermatology uh, practice uh, improved a lot. Actually, we were compelled to involve in teledermatology consultations worldwide. Uh, the teledermatology consultations have gone up uh, about five to ten times compared to the pre-COVID uh, era. So it's an, uh, I mean, a very significant trend towards teledermatology practice. Uh, this is a study done in India, uh, in, all in uh, the case analysis uh, occurring uh, towards the latter part of last year. Uh, so India has a bit of similar setup to Sri Lanka. 
So uh, that will give a good idea uh, about the situation. Uh, so they were able to arrive at a, a definitive diagnosis in about 93% of patients and in patient in person visits were recommended only for about 2 to 2% 2 uh, of the patients out of the patient satisfaction about 18% were very satisfied and about 43 some not satisfied and about one third partially satisfied and about only 6% are unsatisfied so not so bad so about 88% uh, pay uh, Dermatologists felt comfortable providing teleconsultations, and about 82% uh, of dermatologists uh, thought that they need to continue teledermatic services in the upcoming months. So these are the uh, disease entities they have uh, seen in their study uh, in about 7,000 patients. And uh, so there were certain barriers for successful teleconsultation, like duplicate entries, incorrect contact details, and connectivity issues, and also technological inability of the patient or the uh, relative to send a proper picture. So those were the main uh, obstacles. Uh, from the point of uh, clinicians, uh, the opinions were like uh, they, they found uh, about 90% found difficulty in assessing the, the morphology and the topography. And uh, so they wanted higher time per consultation. So it uh, increases about five to 10 minutes more compared to a physical consultation. And uh, they found it's difficult to establish a rapport with the patients and technical or connectivity issues were there in uh, about half of the situation. So, so uh, those are practical difficulties. and. Further, they highlight need for multiple rounds of communication and inability to perform additional testing. We know we do certain bits, uh, side tests when seeing patients and uh, also possibility of prescription misuse. So now with this COVID-19, will teledermatology be the silver lining during and uh, after COVID? So in future, so in this study, they have uh, asked about the opinions, so, but anyway, it is interesting to see that, so most of the consultations were done through WhatsApp and the other uh, social media and over the phone consultation rather than uh, separate teledermatology platforms. So about 70% uh, dermatologists found teledermatology to be slightly difficult for making a diagnosis, and 9% did not find any significant difference, and about 4% found teledermatology easier than physical examination. And uh, so common conditions like acne, tinea, alopecia were easier to diagnose. But uh, when it comes to infections, then pigmentary disorders, inflammatory conditions, then it becomes much more less easy or difficult to arrive at a diagnosis. So in future, uh, would you use teledermatology after COVID with the surge of teledermatology practices. 10% would limit physical consultation and they prefer to use more uh, teledermatology practice, only about 10%. Uh, so the vast majority, about 70%, plan to use it in conjunction with physical consultations. And about 15% claim they will not use it at all. So, uh, so only uh, I mean, uh, it uh, has certain uh, advantages as well as disadvantages. So, it is crucial to be well aware of the opportunities as well as the challenges in teledermatology to entertain the maximum benefit of this uh, modern technical advancements for the benefit of the patients as well as the clinicians. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jana Kasaravita, uh, speaking about the very interesting uh, topic about uh, this uh, teledermatology. Uh, uh, with uh, that uh, speech, we are now finished our all four lectures. Uh, any questions? Yeah, we I can, think we, we, can we have some time question. for questions.
Shall I ask one question from Professor Javani Shalira, sir? Uh, about the distress KBs, uh, have you used ivermectin for the patients? Uh, uh, actually, in your... uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, ivermectin was not available uh, till COVID came around, you know. So I continue stick with I think now it's available. Because the, the, these days, ivermectin, they are the, uh, discussing about the COVID, uh, treating the COVID with ivermectin. Uh, then we can use that uh, for our KBS patients also. Thank you. Yeah.